One more minute, one more minute. Let's gather ourselves. Good morning. Good Ready to worship this morning? Amen. So if you're ready to worship, when you leave this service, you will not be disappointed. The men are going to cover us in a word of prayer at this time. I would ask all the men to position yourself around the sanctuary that we can pray. I'll wait until we are settled. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can a man stand at the door, please? Some, someone stand at the door. Hallelujah. Oh God, we come to worship. Oh God, we come to praise. Hallelujah. Our lips shall praise thee. And thus shall we bless thee. We will lift up our hands in thy name. Oh God, because you teach our hands to war and our fingers to fight. Hallelujah. Oh God, forgive us our sins. Cleanse us this morning as we repent before you. Of all our transgression and our shortcomings, God, hallelujah, wash us this morning. Thank you because you stand strong in the midst of us. Mm. You never leave us or forsake us, but you're with us. You're in the midst of us. <clears throat> Your angels stand guard around us. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power. Protect this service. Cover this service with your blood. Mm. Send your word. We need a word. Mm. Send direction. We need to know where we're going. Mm. Rebuke us. Because we are sons and daughters. We are not pastors. So cover this place. Mama, Sito, Shada. Hallelujah. Send our word. Watch over the media. Mm. No interruption. Watch over the song praise team. Move by your Holy Spirit. And we declare and 
we send your word. Psalms 103, the angels excel in strength and go. That we will rejoice in you. And we will be exceedingly glad in you. And we will dance in you. In Jesus name. this morning because I want you to, to think about this morning. The enemy is on attack everywhere, every area of our lives. This morning we're not playing with him. Our praise is a weapon of war against the enemy. So we're going to use our weapon this morning against him. Amen. Bless his name this morning. I hope his build hope
pray. O oh God, the strength of all who put their trust in Thee, mercifully accept our prayers. And because through the weakness of our mortal nature, we can do no good thing without Thee, give us the help of Thy grace, that in keeping Thy commandments we may please Thee both in will and deed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with Thee, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I will be reading in your hearing the Old Testament scripture for instruction, Psalm 1. That's Psalm 1. Please open your Bibles and turn to Psalm 1. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth Standeth in the way of sinners. <laughs> no, no, standeth in the seat of his scornful, but in his delight is in the law of the Lord, yes. and in the law doth he meditate day and night. <laughs> and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, yes, that he bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Yes. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. But for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So far the scripture. Our New Testament reading for admission will come from St. Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. That's Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. We will read it responsibly. I will read the first verse, and you will read the next verse. And we will conclude until verse 26 when we will read it together. Again, that's Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. And he came down with them and stood in the plain. And the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought out to touch him, for they were virtue out of him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the false prophets. But woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Together, woe unto you, when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. So far the scripture. As you remain muted, let us confess together the declaration of our faith, the Nicene Creed. It will appear on the screen. Let us begin. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe in one Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. When we say one Catholic and apostolic church, we are not only referring to the Roman Catholic Church, but the church universal. And by one baptism for the remission of sins, we mean the baptism of the Holy Ghost. For more information on the creeds, please refer to our website, bethrafa.org, under the heading, Why We Do the Things We Do. You did such a wonderful, wonderful job this morning. We encourage you this morning, young people. Amen. If you're just joining us, we welcome you to Beth Rapha and to the Lord's Day. Song says, in times like these. In fact, before in times like these, it says, I'm anchored in Jesus. Yeah. Old, old song. I woke up last week in the morning, and my father used to sing this song. And the words just came, and I was like, wow. Upon life's boundless ocean, right? Where mighty billows roll, I fix my hope in Jesus, blessed anchor of my soul. When trials fierce assail me, as storms are gathering all, I rest upon his mercy and trust him more. Let's lift that. Come on. Upon life's boundless ocean, where mighty billows roll,
Jesus, for he has for the he power, has power to say. To say.
on sakes, open your mouths and give him a worthy praise this morning. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hand. Dear God, I ask you to protect Bishop and that nothing harmful will get to her. I pray that she will continue to do great work. I ask you, God, to protect the President and that he will make godly decisions leading this country. I pray for the leaders of Bethlehem. I ask you, God, to remind them that their labor will not be in vain. Their reward will come from you. I ask you, God, that all kids, no matter their skin color, will have proper education. I ask you, God, that the people who are struggling, that you will make a way for them. I ask you, God, that we will have a bigger church to serve you, God. And I pray that souls will be saved and that they will get to know Jesus. I ask you, God, that we will have money for our family to be taken care and of and to use for God's kingdom. I pray that we will use our money wisely. God, thank you for always answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, we pray for thine, the kingdom, and the power and glory. Amen. Good morning. Let us. This is a new day! Welcome to Beth Rafa. We all have expectations as we interact with God and with each other. Many times our expectations were fulfilled and we were very happy and excited. We got the job we wanted or the house we dreamed of. But that joy can be easily turned into sorrow when other expectations are not met. Relationships are destroyed, hearts are broken, church membership changes, and even religion is denounced because what was expected was not received. The lesson is this that God gives us what is best for our eternity. We want what is best for our right now, but he gives us what will last for our tomorrows. Trust him before you give up on him. Your expectation should be of him and not of what we want. On behalf of our senior pastor, Bishop Jacqueline E. McCullough, welcome to Beth Rafa, where you can experience healing to heal by loving Christ.
John Henry Clark was born January 1st, 1915 in Union Springs, Alabama during the Great Migration when African Americans moved from the South to the North for better life. Clark arrived in Harlem at the age of 18. He became a part of the Harlem Renaissance. Clark served as a non-commissioned officer in the Army Air Forces, becoming a master sergeant. He was a high school dropout, but became a college professor without a diploma. The African American Heritage Studies Association was founded by Clark. Clark was an intellectual during the Black Power Movement. He challenged the views of academic historians and changed the way African history was studied. Clark married Sybil Williams in 1997. He had a son and a daughter. He was listed as one of the hundred greatest African Americans. He died July 12, 1998. Clark wrote six books, edited, and contributed to 17 others. Clark composed more than 50 short stories. He did research in every African country except South Africa. One of Clark's famous quotes was, History is not everything, but it is a starting point. History is a clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day. It is a compass they use to find themselves on the map of human geography. It tells them where they are, but more importantly, what they must be. John Henry Clark was the founding chairman of the Department of Black and Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College. He earned a doctorate from the non-accredited Pacific Western University, earning a bachelor's degree in 1972. (laughs) Lent, a season of reflection, reevaluation, new beginnings, a time to recognize God's grace in our lives, to find ways that let that realization sink in and take root, drawing closer to God as we are changed by His love. In this season, we should give, give of ourselves, our time, money, possessions, Giving helps us to see better the needs of those around us and brings to light those things that may have too high a priority in our lives. It helps us to separate what we need from what we want, stripping away the things that keep us separated from one another and God. We should fast. It helps us to be reminded of the need for God to fill us. Whether food or social media, your phone, or TV. Fasting allows us to physically feel the ongoing needs of the soul. It helps us to see the truth that only God can truly satisfy. We should pray. It slows us down, focuses us on God. Prayer allows us to be pulled away from our grip on this world and everything we think it can give us. And it moves us closer to seeing God in the midst of it all. God is inviting us into this holy season, wanting us to be free from all the obstacles that keep us from His fullness. May we allow ourselves to be cleansed and renewed so that we may come to understand more powerfully the love of God and be made new in His righteousness and alive in His grace. Beth Rafa has two new ways for you to sow into the ministry, Zelle and Alexio Text Pay. The new email to use for Zelle is BethRafaDigitalCash at RafaAlliance.org. Please put in the notes section where to designate the funds. For example, tithes, general offering, building fund, building fund land, or word alive. Funds go directly into the church's account and a receipt will be sent of all contributions using Zelle. For more information on Alexio TextPay, please go to BethWafa.org for detailed instructions. And we are excited to announce that our fourth Sunday fellowship service will be this evening at 6.30 p.m. 
It will be both on site at 1540 Route 202, Suite 4, Pomona, New York, 10970, and on Zoom using our fellowship link. We certainly pray you'll join us along with your family and friends as we lift up the name of Jesus together. We welcome you to our Barnabas Ministry Discipleship classes live on Zoom every Wednesday from 7 p.m. to 7.45 p.m. Join us this year as we look at the Disciples of Christ. For the month of February, we'll be looking at the life of Thaddeus. And if you'd like to connect with us on Zoom, just go to our website, www.bethrapha.org. Click on the Ministries tab, then on Barnabas. Scroll down and click on Barnabas Ministry Zoom Sessions. If you'd like to view a previous class, go to the Beth Rafa YouTube page and type Barnabas. Also, check out our Barnabas Ministry Group on Facebook. If you have any questions or testimonials, please email us at barnabas at bethrafa.org. We would love to hear from you. These have been your announcements. Any further announcements will come from our bishop. And put your hands together. It's time to worship through our giving. Good morning. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 3 in the NIV. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. If clouds are full of water, they pour rain on the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there will there it will lie. So far the scripture. Now last week our focus on the exhortation was our giving and distribution methodology. We explored verse 2 of the scripture, which investigated why would, why would God instruct us to cast our bread in waters, the plural form. And we looked at the water cycle. We saw that the Bible references at least eight different types of water, therefore validating that we have absolutely no excuse for the inability to wisely, earnestly give or diversify our bread to seven or eight portions. We diversify to mitigate the risk of adversity that surely will come. Nature is referenced throughout Bible and God reveals himself in nature. So walk with me today. Now, clouds. The National Weather Service defines a cloud as a visible aggregate of minute droplets of water or particles of ice or a mixture of both floating in free air. Clouds are formed when the invisible water in the air condenses into visible water droplets or ice crystals. For this to happen, the parcel of air must be saturated, meaning unable to hold all the water it contains in vapor form. So it starts to condense into a liquid or a solid. For us to have clouds, we need to either increase the water content, more giving, in the air through evaporating until the air can hold no more, or the air needs to be cooled so it becomes to the dew point, and that dew point is the temperature at which the air is also unable to hold any more water. Luke 12 and 54 reads in the Amplified Version, he also said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say it is going to rain. And that is how it turns out so far the scripture. So we are limited in our comprehension of thoughts, of God's thoughts and God's ways. I would have cast it to the wind. The children of Israel had a cloud that was a pillar by day and a pillar of fire by night. Are you, am I, on, as we're on this Lord's journey, are we under his cloud that never leaves us? It's a divine synergy. Two-thirds of the planet is covered in clouds, and so they're integral to the water cycle by providing a link between rain, snow, waters, plants, and animals. So let's look at clouds. They also have an important effect on the Earth's climate, the temperature. 
they do the same thing that it did for the children of Israel. Psalm 104 and 3 tells us, He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks on the wings of the wind. So far the scripture. Winds are at every level, moving in every direction at various speeds. So the cloud that I may be, that may be over my house and over my life is different from the cloud that may be over yours. It may not have the same timing of outpouring. It may not have the same volume of rain. Oh my God. I may have a passing cloud. It just rains for a sprinkle, two seconds, and you're dry. Or you might have a torrential downpour while there's sunshine by me. Ladies and gentlemen, the wind of God causes the cloud to be over us different. That is why it's so important to be a corporate kingdom mindset. God is the God of cycles. He's a God of the water cycle, the wind cycle, and the cycle of sowing and reaping. So the creator God who rules and reigns, can, what, who can do nothing else that anyone else can do, there are no limitations in him. So it's, necessi it's a necessity for us to inquire of his wisdom before we cast our bread, if we desire to be in the right position at the right time. Now Job 26 and 8 reads, he wraps up the waters in his clouds and the clouds does not burst under them so far the scripture. So the application is to sow to at least seven or eight portions in multiple waters so it can ascend like a sweet smelling savor to the Lord who keeps record, gives you the credit via one of his many clouds. Now he wraps the clouds from bursting on us. Otherwise, we would have another Noah's Ark situation. Anybody wants to be drowned out? No. So we have to be content with what he gives us because it's his infinite wisdom and his power that he permits the rain, the blessings to fall according to our individual okay, and corporate sad. capacities that will ensure our fruitfulness. He will not give us more than we're ready to handle. In contrast, the trees may fall due to winds or tornadoes and rain, and it could cause water logging in the ground, which causes the tree roots to get root rot, meaning ah, the tree cannot be anchored in the soil. Sometimes when a tree ages, it becomes softer and absorbs more water. Too much moisture in the earth uh, causes bacteria. So the location of where you put your roots, where you plant your roots, it's key. I was reading that there was something, Pastor Brian, about the direction of north and south. And it says that the tree lay there. It north and south, the scripture says. And that means it's ignorance, the north and south ignorance to the truth of God. That he's the true bread. Psalm 1 and 3 says, and it's in my typewritten notes, our Old Testament reading. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf shall never wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So far the scripture. So in conclusion, a tree that falls is not of God. A tree that's planted is of God. The fool does not acknowledge or obey God with his bread. And the scripture says he has no element. He has the elements, but he gets no rain. Proverbs 25 and 14 reads, here begins God's word. Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts in, uh, of his gifts falsely. So far the scripture, not by might, not by power, but... The one who inclines his ear to the wisdom and instruction of God reaps the promises of God. In the light of the king's face is life. And his favor is like a cloud bringing the spring rain. So far the scripture. Be wise this morning and give earnestly to the kingdom of God. The Lord bless you. Amen, Amen as we... Get ready to receive the Lord's offering.
We want to obey God with our bread. Don't be like the fool that didn't obey God with his bread. Aren't you glad that he bindeth the waters in the cloud? He's the one who does it. We do our part. He binds the water in the clouds. And there shall be showers of blessings. Showers of blessings. We need. Amen. Mercy drop round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings. As we receive the Lord's offering at this time, we um, want to uh, remind you that the, you can give your tithe and your offerings at this time. This is good ground. Amen? Amen. 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 The secret place you can worship of the most high shall abide under the shadow. for the word aren't you glad you're under his shadow I tell you where else would you want I don't know who would serve a God like this but I can't help but do it because he is good to me he takes care of me and I'm so glad to be in that secret place under his shadow yeah. amen all right before we receive the word which is coming from our own bishop this morning that's right fourth Sunday was coming from our own bishop Amen. We're going to be favored with in, in the ministry of song uh, by our Reverend Kendra Eaglin. She's in the house. <laughs> Amen. Right over there in that corner. Media. <laughs> Shine that face. There it is. That's it. <laughs> Zoomers, eat your heart out. <laughs> Amen, amen, amen. She's going to minister to us at this time. And immediately following that, our bishop is going to come forward with the word for this morning. Amen? Amen.
closer walk. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's receive our bishop at this time. Amen. You may be seated in the sanctuary. We thank God for all of you being here this morning, whether you're on site or on Zoom or whether you're out there on social media. We thank you so much for just really observing the Lord's day. And you're not just doing it, hopefully, ritualistically, oh, it's a Sunday, got to be in church. But you're doing it because you realize that on a day like today, over 2,000 years ago, your Savior rose from the dead. And that you're not worshiping a statue. You're not worshiping an idea. You're worshiping a living Savior. That makes a difference, you know. That means when you call him, he'll answer. <laughs> Statues can't answer. Amen. Idols can't answer. But Jesus can. Amen. Amen. So this, this afternoon, I'm going to ask you to join me in going to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 6. And somebody said, don't you ever preach from the New Testament? And my attitude is, don't you ever listen? Because I do. I do preach from the... <laughs> yeah. The whole counsel of God. Okay. Um, Ezekiel chapter 6. And I'm going to start at um, verse 8. And I'm going to end at verse 10. Ezekiel chapter 6, starting from verse 8 and ending at verse 10. I'm reading from the, new, from the King James Version. You may be reading from another version. But I believe we'll end up at the same place. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. And yet will I leave a remnant that ye may have some that shall escape the sword among the nations, when ye shall be scattered through the countries. And they that escape of you shall remember me among the nations, whither they shall be carried captives, because I am broken with their whorish heart, which hath departed from me, and with their eyes which go whoring after their idols. And they shall loathe themselves for the evils which they have committed in all their abominations. And they shall know that I am the Lord, and that I have not said in vain that I would do this evil unto them. So far, the reading and hearing of God's word. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. I'd like to salute all of the leaders, the, um, the overseers. Um, uh, we thank God for overseer. Robin Edwards and Overseer Trish McLeod and the executive pastors. I don't always name them, but this morning I'd like to salute them. Amen, the McKenzies. I know they're out doing other things. And then I'd like to salute um, one of our Alliance pastors. Amen. Pastors John and Carolyn Jameson. It's good to have you here. Damascus, amen. Amen. You're here this morning. And all of you who are visiting, it's good to have you in the house. And those who are members and are still visiting, it's good to have you anyway. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Ah. The, title, the title of this sermon is The Pathway Back, meaning the journey to come back. Or a subtitle could be a few out of many. 
a few out of many. E Ezekiel is one of those books that you're not really in a hurry to read because it is full of a lot of imageries and metaphors and, you know, um, dreams and visions that, that need a lot of interpretation. It's not like reading Psalms or even Proverbs. It's not, it's not an easy read. It's a prophetic book that needs interpretation a certain way. And um, he has a lot of symbolic language like revelation, okay? And a lot of people jump to revelation, but I don't know what they're saying because it's just so loaded with symbols. But he's the author of this particular book. And he belongs to a time in Israel's history when the people in the early years of Babylonian captivity, what do we mean by the, the children of Israel went into captivity? What do we mean by captivity? They were taken over by another country. And so Nebuchadnezzar had come in and taking the people into captivity. And he did it um, in, in three series or three groups went down in the early time. It was Daniel um, that went down. And then the second attack came and additional captives went down. And then Ezekiel must have been around the time when, um, when, when in 587 BC, when that captivity came. So it went into series and they went into um, Babylon and he sacked Jerusalem. And so the children of Israel are now in Babylon and they should be there. It says 70 years, but 70 years is like a completion. You know, seven is always a completion, but they actually spent 50 years. Ezekiel has a beautiful picture of the future age in which God will triumphantly or triumph for his people. And it's really talking about God establishing a universal reign, especially through the descendant of David leading up to the coming of the Messiah. So he, you know, 400 years before Jesus was born, 500 years rather, before Jesus was born, Ezekiel saw this. So he was a bona fide prophet. We already see stuff that's already seen. You know, when we prophesy, we see stuff that we already see. But he saw stuff 500 years ago. So in, in, these, in, in, in these particular uh, parables, symbolic behavior, I mean, it was not just visions, but he lived out a certain way. He lived out a certain way. And, and he portrayed God's message to the people in a very demonstrative way. So through his parables, he portrayed God's covenant people as helpless newborn children, as lioness who cared carefully for her cubs, as a sturdy cedar, as a doomed and useless vine. So it's just a lot of imagery that you have to really plow through and study carefully. He also used a clay tablet to portray Babylon's siege against Jerusalem. He ate his bread with quaking and drank his water with trembling and anxiety to symbolize God's wrath and carried his belongings about to show that God would allow his people to be carried into exile. In other words, he ate bread quaking and shaking. Now, you all would laugh, but what he's saying is he's showing how terrible God was, how awesome God was, and that's the kind of effect he has on his people. And that he also showed, you know, he carried around uh, um, um, his belongings on, on, uh, on his back to show that God was going to allow the people to be carried into exile. So his whole life, these imageries were lived out in his life physically to show God's people what God was saying because they didn't have the written word. They just have a bona fide prophet. So what's going on in this chapter 6? In chapter 6, we have the threat of destruction of Israel. Why? Because they practice idolatry and the destruction of their idols. And then you also have the promise of a gracious return of a remnant. 
that will come because of true repentance and reformation. And that's where we are parked. We are parked with the remnant. Okay? So the first point is, and, and I just gave you a little overview of Ezekiel, but if you want to know more about him, you can. But the first point is a preserved remnant. A preserved remnant. So in Ezekiel 6, 8, he says, I will leave a remnant. Because some of you will escape the sword. You will escape the famine. In other words, there is general calamity. God is coming after Israel with judgment. But there's some of you that will escape this. Even though they were scattered and they were dispersed. Even though they escaped the sword. The walls of Jerusalem was his security. It was now turned, torn down. And now God is saying, I will save a few. A remnant. Now, a remnant doesn't mean small, small, small. It means in comparison. You know how they grade you on the curb. Okay? It, it, it's based on how many people did it, so and so and so and so. And, and then that's why you got the, the C minus. See, so a, 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 a people out of a people, a few out of many. You understand that? So he, he says, I'm going to save a few out of many. And why? Because I'm going to have the seed of another generation is always about the seed. That's how you produce generations, from the seed. For those of you who don't like seed givers, you know, this is, mm, all right. He saved some to get many. He saved some. That's why you're here. That's why God saved you. Because generations are supposed to come out of you. You're not supposed to be barren. You're not supposed to be non-productive. So he saved so they could have another generation. So Jerusalem could flourish again. So these are the ones who escaped sword and pestilence and famine. Led into captivity. And they, they were humbled on account of their abominations. And they were to leave their idolatry and worship him alone. So the captivity had a purpose. You need to tell yourself, my journey has a purpose. I know you don't like that. We don't like that word. But your journey has a purpose. Yeah. You know, the, 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 he came to leave a remnant that's distinguished from the whole group, okay? And he left a remnant so that they could continue his purpose in the earth. Isaiah 1 and 9, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. So this is the comfort that Ezekiel is bringing. You're going down into captivity, but God is going to preserve. That's why we are preserved generation. He's not preserving you so you could live out your best life. He's preserving you so you could produce and reproduce and continue his purpose in the earth. So what it was that saved them from the calamities? The host that left a small, Lord of hosts left a small remnant. What kept them from apostasy? How come they were saved? In the worst of time, there's always a remnant. I don't care how many people leave in the church. And let me announce to you, I don't care how many people talk about the church. And the church didn't do this and the church didn't do that. And I agree, the church can be a testing place, especially since you came. Because we all bring our stuff. We bring our stuff to church. 
The only way you can put the church down is if you have no stuff. And if you don't have any stuff, you're dead. So, and even in the worst of times, he has a remnant preserved from iniquity and reserved for mercy. You're being preserved from sin and reserved for mercy. <laughs> As Noah and his family, in the middle of the deluge, the Bible said that Noah and his family and, and a percentage of the animals were saved uh, and it's like Lot that was taken out of Sodom and Gomorrah. So divine grace always triumphs. Don't you think in your mind for one millisecond that God doesn't have a people? Don't you think? This remnant is, can be very small compared to the popular church. But God's work is to sanctify and save them and to preserve them. Except he had left us that remnant, there will be nothing left. If he doesn't save a remnant, he's coming back for nothing. And God is coming back for a church. He's not coming back to crack the sky for nobody. But he's coming back for a remnant. It is good for a people that have been saved from utter ruin to look back. It's good for you to take a minute and look back on the kind of things he saved you from. Don't be so, you know, um, 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 my mother would say numbskull. Don't be a numbskull and forget. It doesn't take long, it wasn't long ago you messed up royally. That's right. That's right. It wasn't long ago I tripped over myself. It wasn't, it wasn't that long ago that the Lord had to snatch me quick, 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 yes, quick, yes, quick, yes. quick before it went too deep. Yes. You, you, you know, you can get so far deep in sin that you see no way of coming out of it. It wasn't so long ago that he stopped the falling. And he grabbed me just in time. He left us a few good men. <laughs> you need to tell yourself, I'm one of them that's left. I'm one of them that's left. I don't care what you think about me. I'm one of them that remained. I'm one of them that escaped. It could have been worse than it was. I could have been, listen to it, still in it. He would have the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Yes, 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 yes. The second point is you have a preserved remnant. You also have a repentant remnant. You see, preserved remnant comes forth because of their repentance. That's how you know you're preserved. You're preserved because you're repentant. Preserve remnants, repent. The ones he chosen for him knows how to change their mind. Wow. He doesn't preserve you for you to have the same mind. He doesn't prefer, preserve you so you could continue to be arrogant and to resist him. He preserves you to bring you to a place of repentance. And they that escape of you shall remember me among the nations. Okay? Because I am broken with their whorish heart. So to those, to those whom their God's designed for life is to walk away from God, their idols, but the ones who have been chosen were chosen to give repentance unto life. But it's interesting to note, I remember when the pandemic first started, someone interviewed this theologian, I can't remember his name, I'm so sorry, I didn't. And uh, I didn't put it down or, or make note of it. But he said, just because there's a pandemic and people are dying, just because people are suffering, it doesn't mean that they're going to repent. 
We often think, oh, God is bringing them. God is taking them through. And after this, they're going to be sorry. That's absolutely not true. If that's so, then a lot of people should be in church crying and jumping and praising the Lord. So just because people go through difficulty, embarrassment, and loss, it doesn't mean that they're going to turn towards God. But the remnant that's marked, the person that's marked to be a remnant reserved out of the body, they are the ones who are brought to repentance. The arrogant will continue to be arrogant. The rebellious will continue to be rebellious. But those who are chosen, and we don't repent at the same time. How God deals with us, he deals with that individually. A person might look like they'll never repent. A person may be arrogant today like you were yesterday, but it doesn't mean that you're not the remnant. So we can't sit down and start tracking people and thinking that because they are where they are that they're not part of the remnant. We know somewhere, as the old folks between, so would say, between sunrise and sunset, yes. you're going to repent. <laughs> That's the thing about remnant. It doesn't matter when. It doesn't matter where. We can't track it. It's none of our business. But God has a set time when his people that he has chosen, snatched from the jaws of hell, will repent. They didn't escape. He didn't cause you to escape that for you not to repent. He didn't keep that from you for you not to repent. He didn't, he didn't save you from that mess for you not to repent he didn't he didn't he didn't protect you from that particular disease for you not to repent he he didn't choose you at the time that he chose to separate you from certain things for you not to repent. Be encouraged. Repentance coming. Be encouraged. Oh, come on. Somebody who thinks that somebody who will never repent. I said be encouraged. Repentance. He allows grace to repent. And he allows space to repent. Oh, come on. You all know we got space. Some of us sitting here, he gave us much space. And the space went from days to weeks. And the, uh, the space went from weeks to months. And the space went from months to years. Huh? You ought to thank God for the space of grace. If it wasn't for his kindness, we wouldn't be here repenting. And God sets it up to bring us to a point. So we don't repent just so. He you don't. Know, just look at how we deal with confrontation when we're caught with our hands in the cookie jar. <laughs> we, don't, we ain't going to say, you know, I'm truly, whatever. We're going to have a justification. What cookie? <laughs> what you talking about? What you talking about? <laughs> they start talking fast. What you talking about? We're not going to own it. We're not built to own it. We lost that ability to be submissive to God readily. When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, the forbidden fruit, they readily responded to God. There was no such thing as a second thought or a discussion or a reasoning. It was just a flow. God in me, I'm in God, and we on the same page. But when sin came, here comes rebellion. Here comes reasoning. Here comes debate. Here comes justification. Here comes covering. Oh, come on. Here comes a new definition. That's not what it means. <laughs> We're good at new definitions right now in this postmodern age, this age of integrationists. Everybody got a new definition for sin, a new definition for what's right and what's wrong. That's all right. You inherited that. We all inherited it. So we are not ready to own stuff. Who told you? Who told you that you were naked? <laughs> That's where it all started. Who told you? How'd, how'd you get here? How'd you get here? Instead of saying, I, I really, I really am so sorry and I hate the fact 
that I just went against what you said and I bit into it I, and I admit that I did like it. It tasted so good, but it just offended you and I just feel so separated from you. No, you didn't hear that. It's the serpent. And then it's the woman. You see what I'm saying? We're not ready to own. Sin immediately set up a new order. A new order where I'm not to own it because if I own it, I have to forsake it. So what is repentance? Repentance is not just feeling sorry. I remember years ago, I used to go when I went to church in, 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 in Harlem, we used to go around the corner every Good Friday because we didn't have Good Friday service. So we'd go around to the Methodist church and um, we would go to hear their service because we were so fascinated. Not all of us went, just a few of us. You know, um, I didn't see some of you all from St. John there, but it was a few of us that went around the corner. And um, we went to the, the service, and, uh, uh, and they were good. They were, th those, those Baptist fellows were good. Those, but they could take those seven last saints and make you stand on top of your head. And I happened to have been sitting next to somebody, and they would sing those songs. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? And you know they sang it and they sang it right. They didn't jazz it up. They just sang it straight. And, and there was somebody sitting next to me. And you know, she had a little something before she got to church. You could smell it. It's a little something. Because you have to have a little something when you go into service like that. Especially you, you know. And she boo-hooed through the whole service. As soon as they say, were you there? When they, who, 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 who? I said, oh my God. But does that mean she repented? She was a sorry. And then she had a little something to help her feel sorry. So what is repentance? Repentance is turning, turning away from sin, disobedience, or rebellion, and turning back to. So there are two actions with repentance. You have to turn away and then turn to. If you don't if you turn away and don't turn to, you're going to go back to the same thing. Come on, let's kill the game in here this morning. Let's kill the game. Let's kill the game. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why. You know, I, I do feel bad and I know I'm wrong. But why are you back over there? Because you didn't turn to. God cannot lie. You have to turn away from and then turn to. If you don't make that turn to, you're going to go back. Because back is familiar. It's, even if it's wrong, it's familiar. It's comfortable. You understand? So repentance means you turn away from sin, disobedience, or rebellion, and you turn back to God. Repentance means a change of mind. Your emotions might feel bad, but your mind isn't changed. You got embarrassed, feel bad, feel remorse, but not enough to turn to the opposite direction. So turning to the opposite direction means turning to a, a level of relationship with God that you didn't have before. So the remnant, they were worshiping idols. And now, because I'm taking them through and I'm not destroying them, I save them to turn. So what is, what is the reason why God is putting us through? Why he keeps putting you through that and putting you through that? Why you keep tripping up and all of that? He's not trying to kill you. He's trying to get you to turn back. And back means a mind change. Not a feeling change. Because feelings lie. But God's word stands forever. So the, the key word there, how did you get, how did you get repentance, in, repentance in this text? It says, remember. That's what it says. Isn't that what it says here? And they that accept of you shall what? Remember me. And remember literally means to mark. It means to be mindful, to recount, to record. It means to think on it well. So the, what, the way is, 
when you when you repent, you remember. What are you remembering? You're remembering what he took you out of. You're remembering the offense. You're remembering what the Lord uh, delivered you from. You escape. I like that word escape. You escape something. Listen to me. I know what it is to escape. And sometimes you have to, it's such a little slither. You understand? If I didn't move when he told me to move, just, just that little window, that's right. I, I wouldn't be here this morning. He made a way. I said he made a way of escape. And you're sitting here because God caused you to escape from something, someone. And you remember, you recall. What do you recall? The goodness of God. You recall the mercy of God. You recall how good, how great he is and how kind he is and how much he doesn't put your stuff on Facebook. <laughs> didn't put your dirty laundry in the street. You understand? He, he didn't parade your mess. <laughs> he just caused an escape. So, he... He wants you to what? Repent. And we told you what repentance is, and it is because you're mindful. Now, many of us suffer from amnesia because we don't like to remember the depth of our depravity, as Reverend Wanda talked about this morning. We don't like to see ourselves like that. We don't like to see ourselves as being in that kind of situation. I don't know about you, but every now and then, the Lord takes me back to something, something, or I dream about something that he delivered me from. And I, when I wake up, I say, oh, God, I thank isn't that a Isn't that a shout moment? Lord, have mercy. I just start rocking and praising. I, I'm not there. I'm not there anymore. I'm not in that. Any, what a moment of victory. Because what? I remember. Don't try to act like you don't remember. So there's repentance. The next point is, you know, you, you, you have the preserve. You have the repentant. But there's a process of repentance. I want to take you through the process and then I'm finished. Because I am broken with their whorish heart. Now, now the word broken means to burst, to break down or to break in pieces, to bring forth, to crush, to hurt, to tear. He said, because when I have broken, so it, it, it's a lot going on with the commentaries and the grammar. But the conclusion is, it's not God is broken. A lot of people would like to think that, to take the stuff off of them. But it's that God broke the whorish heart. See, because if he didn't break it, you wouldn't claim it. If you didn't break it, you wouldn't own it. You ain't going to own it unless you break. <laughs> You're not going to own it until something comes to crush it. He said, when I broke, when I broke it, you understand? Their whorish hearts would still have forgotten God if he had not broken their hearts with judgment. The whorish heart, their heart of whoredom, idolatrous heart that was full of sin, addicted to it, addicted you don't you don't addiction is hard you don't break addiction like that unless something breaks it go to all the treatment therapy place all you want to lock up someplace for three months and when you come back the first time you sniff something you back on it listen that stuff don't go away so easy you say you're not going to do it and you keep away from it and starve yourself you're only starving yourself to get full again and every time you go back you get fuller <laughs> oh help me god help me god yeah you go on a fast or you go on a diet and you can't wait to get off the diet so you could eat the big fat hamburger. Uh, what? 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 Huh? You're starving yourself to get greedy. It takes God to break the addiction. Oh, come on. It takes God to cut through some things. 
things that we delighted in. You love it. You like it. You enjoyed it. It brought you some satisfaction. You don't give that up so easily. Even though it's killing you. It's destroying you. It's injurious to your heart. It's injurious to your relationship with God. It messes your relationship with everybody else. You end up being a monster. But still yet you're in it. And you can't get out of it unless he breaks it. Oh, 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 Lord, you all help me right here now. I feel something coming up. Yes, I do. Brokenness is what I want from you. And so he, he had to break through. He had to break you to bring you. Come on, tell yourself, yes, he's breaking me to bring me. Because we don't come quickly. You know, when I was in Jamaica, if, 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 if what they did in Jamaica when I was a child in school, they would arrest the teachers. They would call, they would call it physical abuse. Because, you know, I wasn't raised with these psychological kinds of conversations. You know, there was no conversation. <laughs> you, you, you didn't converse. So whenever you did something wrong, there, there are ways and means that they handle it. And one of the ways is, you know, for instance, if you're hard of hearing and you don't want to listen, they will grab you by your ear and pull you around the classroom. What? See? That's one, the ear, the ear pulling. And you better not scream much. The other one is if you had a cussing spirit, they would, you know, it's called um, Life Boy Soap. Yeah. They would have you stand in front of the class with the big bar, the big bar of soap sticking out your mouth. And. Come on, Bishop! There were ways and means of getting us to understand. Well, God has ways of means of getting you and me to understand I'm not playing. Yes. I didn't call you to play. I call you to change. Romans 2 and 4. Or despisest thou the riches of this, his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God. Now, the goodness of God doesn't mean candy and ice cream. The goodness of God means discipline. The goodness of God lead it, lead to what? Repentance. That's all he wants from you. You think he wants, oh, he wants my money. Oh, something's going wrong with my marriage. Something's going wrong with my this. No, he, or something's wrong with my body. Father, in the name of Jesus. No, no, no. He, he, he done heard that before. He wants your repentance. He wants my mind to change a about the way we're living with him and for him. He wants me to submit to his way of thinking and doing with my body, with my thoughts, with my money, and with my relationship. All that's going on in my life is for that one moment of repentance. So, you know, it's, it's not, I'm going to get it together. I'm going to work it out. No. Change of mind. Psalm 34 and 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save it such as be of a contrite spirit. Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou will not despise. Come on, Jeremiah, and take a trip with me. Where are we going? We're going to the potter's house. The Bible potter. The Bible potter. Going to the Bible party. <laughs> going to the potter's house. What you going down to the potter's house? I want to show you something. You can't understand it unless I show you. 
if I try to explain to you, you won't capture the essence and the power of this. So I'm taking you to the potter's house, and I'm going to take you to a potter's wheel. You know, you know, leaders, when we first started, I, I showed you the, the, that picture of the Hafni Indians and how they made potters pottery rather and I showed you about the wheel yeah and you went when 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 they didn't like it what they do they crush it and all y'all just jump see because you all felt that crush all right so 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 I'm taking you there because I want to show you what I want to do with the ones that I'm making I don't do it with everybody Jesus I don't mess with bastards I just fool I just fool around with people that's going to take my kingdom into this world. And I saw something wrong. Everybody said, oh, it's not a beautiful vase. And oh, it's not a beautiful piece of pottery. And everybody ooing and oing. Oh, I'd like to be like that. I'd like to have that. And God said, but there's something wrong with it. <laughs> what you celebrate, God disregards. There's a hairline fracture. You can't see it with the naked eye because man look it on the outward appearance. But God checks out the heart. I got to crush you one more time. I got to crush you down. Not crush you to throw you away. I don't throw my pottery away. I don't throw my dust away. Because <laughs> that's all it is, dust. I don't throw my dirt away. <laughs> I just make it over. Oh, come on. You talk about a makeover? Many of you would die if somebody would come in here and put you on TV and make you over. <laughs> God says, that's what I seek to do. It's a process of repentance. So the first thing is, I'm going to break you and crush you. The next thing is, I'm coming after your eyes. Repentance includes what you're looking at. <laughs> mm -hmm. The eyes are the windows of the soul. He said their eyes went a whoring after other idols. And the, the, the word for idols in this text is called dung, D-U-N-G, gods. It's another form, another way of saying Beelzebub, Lord of the dung. So you, you're going after dung. When you worship another god, you're going after dung. Yes, 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 yes. So, so your eyes, in order for them to worship, they had to raise their eyes to these idols. Just like you raise your eyes to the, 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 the screen. It's an eye thing. But you see. Ain't no, ain't no blind person doing that. Blind people got to have the real thing. They got, you know, they got to touch it. Everything about this technology has to do with eyes. Now they want to take a picture of your eyeball. You go to the airport and you're into some kind of plan and they ask you to stick your eyes up there. I tell them, no, I'll, I, you, you can, I ain't doing, I'm not doing this. No, you ain't, you ain't, mm -mm. I'll go on the regular line. I'm going on the regular line where they pat me and all them, but I ain't doing this. I ain't doing that. See? The whole thing about illusion, the whole thing about putting on the glasses and you're in a certain place has to do with the eyes. Because the eyes are like camera lens. It take, they take pictures and register it in the brain so you could live it out. That even after you take it off, you're still in it. It's an adulterous, manipulative move. It's a, it is a central piece of technology. If I can get your eyes glued to it, I got you. Isn't that what Nebuchadnezzar to say to some teenage boys? I love them teenage boys. If I were there, I would just hug them so much. And I would love them so much. I'd sit with them and eat with them, you know. Even if they eat vegetarian food, I'll eat with Daniel because I kind of like him, kind of like him. These are young teenagers. They are in a country as, 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 as in exile, in captivity, 
And the king said, when you hear the music, I want you to lift up your eyes and worship and bow down to this colossal figure. <laughs> and the boys were bad enough. God, they were bad enough. <laughs> I wonder what happened to a, this generation. They were so convinced of what their mother taught them. We're so convinced of hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. Teach it to them when they get up in the morning. Teach it to them when they go to bed at night. That's what we're going to say in the covenant today. Teach it to them when you change your clothes and teach it to them when they sit down to eat. Write it on the tables of their heart. Put it over the doorposts uh, that there's only one God. The boys were ruined. They, it got down in their system. It got down in their thinking it ruled and drive them they made their decisions based on it so when they had other offers they had something to give them the power to reject it if you don't have something on the inside to reject it you're gonna bow and you're gonna kiss oh king we're not trying to be rude <laughs> but we don't bow and we don't kiss Ah, and even if we don't come out of this fire, our God is worthy to be worshipped. Turn up the heat. Do whatever you do. But they had enough courage in them. Ah, they had enough conviction because they were totally turned towards God. I'm coming after your eyes. Your eyes seeing stuff you're not supposed to see. It used to be peeping toms. Yeah. That's some of you that are young people, you don't know what I mean. Yeah. I'm sure they still they no peeping peeping. You don't have to peep anymore. You can have full blown full blown vision. You know, of course it's it's it may not be real. The peeping toms looked at real people. Yeah, they looked at, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they would peep, peep through windows and peep through crack doors and, you know, and, and have their, um, what do you call them, binoculars and they would peep in your, see? You don't have to do that anymore. You, you just sit in, your, you know, even in church you could be peeping. The eyes. Peeping at the text. Peeping at the text. And the text. And it's sex texting. You could, be, you could be doing that right in church. Sitting in the pulpit. Getting ready to preach the gospel. But peeping. Oh, you all don't want to hear me. You don't want me to talk like this. Now see. And God said, repentance means your eyes must be turned towards me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And some people say, you're so critical. You know, you, you see certain things and you go, mm. See, and the kids know what that means when I say, mm-mm. That means that I, I've done seen something that hurt my eyes. It just, you know, when, when you have your eyes on Jesus, something just hurts your eyes. You know, it, it just hurts to look at you. Got to turn your head real quick because that's a painful sight right there. See? But when the enemy has your eyes, it has your eyes to be glued. Because once you capture something, it sticks to your heart. And God said, I'm coming after your eyes because you use it to go after your idols. And you really not repented until I mess up the way you look. I'm messing up what you look at. <laughs> I feel help. I feel help. I'm almost finished. God said, I'm coming to mess up what you looking at. <laughs> that's, how, that's how adultery starts. See, um, adultery, but I was having eyes full of adultery. Isn't that what he said in Second Peter 2.14? You know, it, 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 having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. 
When your eyes are full of whorish, whorish, lust, lust, person walk by, you know, and, and you, your neck just goes in a certain direction. See? Oh, you, 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 you've been sophisticated now. You know how to look without turning your head. <laughs> you've become skillful because you know Sally Sue sitting next to you so you better not turn your neck because <laughs> you might not have a neck when you what? <laughs> your peripheral vision has been developed I'm coming after what you Focus on. Eyes mean focus. What got you going all day long? Not me. Because you didn't do your devotion. You didn't pray. Something got you going where that's your focus. In the morning, in the noonday, anything can come and trigger it and it's gone. It's gone. So I'm coming. I have to break that because that's part of the repentance process. If I don't break that, you will be right back where you started. And then the next stage, this is a clincher and I'm finished. The next stage is loathe yourself. I got to break you. I got to change your view, your focus. And now I'm going to cause you to loathe yourself. Now, this is really a problem for today when everybody preaches on self-esteem and love yourself. Love yourself. You know, love, love, love your lying self. <laughs> love your cussing self. Just, just love, just love. You know, love your gluttonous self. Just love. When repentance sets in, sets in, I'm on the road of repentance. God help me. I'm on the way to change. I feel my mind changing. I feel my taste changing. Things that used to excite me, they yeah. turn me off. It's called loathing, loathing, loathing. You see, it means to cut off. It means to be grieved. You understand? It means it wounds you. When you load yourself, you're wounded. When, 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 it, when that situation comes up, it, 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 it causes you to almost feel like you want to run. It, it, it turns you. So you find it, here's the word, repulsive. Yeah. If you're still entertaining it, if you're still thinking there's nothing wrong with it, I, I don't do it as much. I only do it when I'm stressed. That means you didn't load it yet. You got to hate it, so at no time, any time, for all time, it makes me sick. <laughs> Lord have mercy. You don't hear people saying anymore, I got sick to my soul. Isn't that what David said? When I thought about what I did, how I offended you. We're going to read that, read that 51st Psalm. It ought to make you sick. You don't go around defending yourself. You don't go around protecting yourself. You humbly submit to the fact that this offended God. And because it offends God, it offends me to my core. Repentance causes you to find it to the point where you want to vomit when you think about it. It's a turn off. You condemn your own self before somebody even condemns you. You understand? You don't wait for men to condemn you. You condemn yourself. Woe is me. For I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I hang out with dirty mouth people. Jesus have mercy. <laughs> when you get like that, why are you talking like that, Isaiah? You've been hanging out with them for a long time. What causes you to change now? Because I was in the presence of God. 
when I hear them say holy, 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 that holiness got a hold to me. Lord have mercy. It broke me down. It broke me down to the point where I hated my own mouth. The very instrument that you use to get pleasure, you turn around and hate it. Don't hate your mouth. You've got cute lips. Them lips been doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> and if you don't hate it, your lips going to keep doing it. You got to hate it. Loathe. Loathe is a strong word to abhor. It's like the word abhor. It means you resent it. And when somebody introduces it to you, you almost get fighting mad because you realize how ugly you have been. How ugly. How much I have been distasteful. Been distasteful to God. It takes the Holy Ghost to give you that kind of mind or else you'll make up a story. Well, you know, that's your opinion. Do what you do what do what you feel you like and 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 be what be true to your true self. See? And the Lord said, "Listen, when you abhor it, then I, you, can, you can receive what I have. When men remember God against whom they have sinned and consider how he grieves him. And when they are broken for it themselves, then they load their sins in themselves and they will come to true repentance. There's a difference between repentance and true repentance. It means I'm truly sorry. It means that my conscience has been fully pricked. It means my idol has been torn down. It means that those things that gratified my heart I now find detestable. It means the things that I used to get joy out of is a big turn off. I see you coming. I see it coming I see it coming and it turns me off and for you who like to turn people on back to their detestable things there's another part of hell for you they that truly loathe sin cannot but loathe themselves because of sin so self-loathing is a companion to true repentance Unless you get like that, you won't be like that. Lord have mercy. Unless you get like that, you won't turn. Remember, you're turning from to. Unless you get like that, you won't turn over here. You'll go back. You got to hate it. You got to hate it until you can't stand the smell of it. You understand? There's some foods, you know, my mother, you know, being from the Caribbean, she used to fix certain things, you know, and um, she, she could make anything taste good. But I don't care how much it tastes, I ain't eating it. I ain't eating nobody's tripe. I'm sorry, I can't do it. I can't, I can't do it. I can't. Can't, I can't. I can't, mama, I can't do it. See what I'm saying? I can't eat nobody's pig feet with the toes hanging. I can't. I can't do it, Mark. No. I can't eat no chicken with the fingers. I can't. No, I can't. Can't do it. I don't care how much you season it down and cook it down. I can't. I can't. And when you repent, you are now ready. To be reconciled. You cannot reconcile yourself. Stop trying to reconcile. Reconcile yourself means trying to make it right on your terms. Yes. Well, I'm, it, it's not all that bad. So, you know, I'm not doing it the way I used to do it. And so I'm doing better. What do you mean by doing better when you're still doing it? Stop playing with your mind. You cannot reconcile yourself. 
God is the one that set up the reconciliation process. And you're a candidate for reconciliation when you repent. So the last point is a reconciled remnant. And they shall know that I am the Lord. They shall be convinced of it by the experience that I'm going to take them through. They shall know that I made it good. I work it for good. I had good intentions. That I was provoking them to righteousness. One way or the other, God knows how to make us come to repentance even by ruin. Even if he has to drag you. All true repentant art are brought to acknowledge that God is not unjust. As a matter of fact, he's awfully righteous. John 16 and 8, and when he's come, he will reprove the Holy Spirit. Now, who is doing, who is doing the pulling and the drawing? You know, don't, don't, don't say that I don't know what you're talking about. Because you hear the Lord talking, even in the midst of doing it. Even in the midst of doing it, you hear the Holy Ghost tugging at you. Even while you're doing it. That's why, you know, you have to go in it deep to forget. You have to do it harder than anybody else to forget. If you've ever tasted God, God help me. If you've ever drank of the cup of mercy. If you've ever been in his presence. Have you ever felt that gut, gut feeling for God? The word of God got a hold to you and lifted you at a place of newness and, re and refreshing you and restoring you. If you've ever felt his arms around you. Have you ever felt his forgiveness knowing that you didn't deserve it when he gave you another chance? You can't drink like that and forget. And so when the enemy takes you off your path and you're out there doing it, in the midst of all of that, you hear the Holy Ghost saying, I called you. <laughs> I chose you. Before you were born and in your mama's womb, I chose you. <laughs> While sin, you're wallowing in sin as, as, as hog to the wallow and dog to the vomit. In the midst of the vomit and the wallow, you hear the Lord say, but before your mama met your daddy, I wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life. You can't taste that and don't hear the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit didn't only come to make us speak in tongues and jump on one leg. The Holy Ghost comes to reprove, to reprove, to reprove, to prove, to persuade, to influence, to convince you of your crime and to cause you to turn to repentance. So who is doing the convincing? The Holy Spirit. Who is drawing you? The Holy Ghost. I'm going away and I'm going to leave you. But I'm sending you a comforter. <laughs> ah, this comforter is not going to be on you. He's going to be in you. And this comforter is not going to leave you alone until you bow to my will. This comforter going to check you when you're wrong. Instruct you when you need direction. Reprove you when you've done something out of order. So don't you think that you're out here by yourself. As much as we stray, as much as we fall, ah, the Holy Ghost is on his job. What is he doing to bring me from here to here? To pull me from over here and have me repent. Change my mind to the point where I hate the thing that God hates. I reject the thing that God rejects. And I'm satisfied. Yeah. And you know sometimes the Lord pull you out of stuff. And you're sorry that he pulled you out of. You know. And you still talk about. You know. Um, it, back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> you know back in the day. Because if it was a good day. He wouldn't have pulled you out. It was all that wonderful. He wouldn't need to break you. And crush you. And bring you this far. So many of us are resented, resentful rather, because he interrupted that stuff. But you see, you were already chosen. You're his. So you're actually saying, I resent that I'm one of God's children. I don't want to be his daughter right now. 
I want to be a daughter of Belial. <laughs> I want to be a son of Belial. I want to shake my rear end and carry on. I just want to be a son of Belial. And God keeps saying, but you can't be what you're not. It's too late. You should have died at birth. You should have been aborted. The, the mere fact that you were born and you were born for me. God, Lord, help me. I don't care how much you over here, but eventually you're going to be glad to get up. The old folks used to say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. They weren't just talking about a physical house. They were glad from where the Lord brought them. And then they would sing a long song and say, look where the Lord brought me from. Brought me out of darkness into this marvelous light. They didn't say, look where I came from. He said, look where the Lord brought me from. Oh, it's not you bringing yourself. You ain't that decent and you ain't that kind. And you ain't that mannerable and you're not that sweet. Just a little rebel. But look where the Lord brought me from brought me out so I could love him brought me out so I could be in agreement with him brought me out so I could have joy unspeakable and full of glory brought me out so that I can live with myself brought me out so that I can have a new focus my eyes are looking somewhere else I used to look over there but my eyes are looking unto him who is the author and the finisher of my faith Lord have mercy what a change what a what a transformation my god it's like a take it's like taking a bath being dirty for a long time and being stinky for a long time and being muddy for a long time and somebody turns on the shower and now i can look at myself and see what the lord has done this thing called repentance is the key to your reconciliation is the key to your sanctification is the key to your glorification is the key to your eternal life never 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 owning means that there's some more crushing never owning means that you still love it never owning Literally means that you have not yielded completely. You can't reconcile when you have not changed your mind. And that's the misery piece. So this is the nature of conviction. Psalm 51. I want you to read it with me. From the King James. This is how you know something is happening on the inside. Tell yourself, don't fight it. Don't fight it. You are blessed when you're under conviction. Don't make anybody make you feel bad. You're already feeling bad. And it's an honor to be convicted. Because he only pulls on those that he intend to use and he loves eternally. So Psalm 51, starting the first verse, it's a long little psalm, but you ain't going no year yet. Here we begin the reading of God's holy word. Have mercy upon me. You all ain't reading with me. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, 
and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. The word of the Lord to the people of God. There's a pathway back. I don't care how far you have gone. There's a way back. And the way is repentance. There's a way back because God brought you through difficulty, through experiences. You're part of a remnant testimony to an evil world that God has the power to change his people's heart. There's a way back because now you hate the thing that you love the most. There's a way back because you want God more than you want yourself. There's a way back. There's a way back because God is taking your eyes from being glued to destruction and turning your eyes to the glories of God. You're on a path. Don't run. Don't hang your head in shame because you're not on this path by yourself. Well, so-and-so look like they got it together. You are not on this path by yourself. So I pray for you out there today. And I'm speaking to those of you who feel hopeless and helpless. He breaks addiction. He breaks habits. He pulls you through to the point where you want him and you're satisfied with him alone. Where nothing rules you, controls you. But the Holy Spirit directs you. Where you are not a play and a pawn for the enemy where the enemy controls you based on your weakness he knows that he just have to press a button God you helped me this morning mm. and he presses it because he knows you're going down <laughs> oh but I thank you God that the button pressing is over come on help me here help me help me and in the mighty name of Jesus, I speak to you. Wherever you are right now, sitting on the side of your bed, getting ready to give up, because you find yourself in the same hole in 2024. The Lord said, you turned from it, but you didn't turn to me with all of your heart. And God, give them the ability to want what you say, to want your identity that you gave them your purpose that you assigned to them help them to be in agreement so they can be free I trust you for it now I trust you for that young man sitting on the side of the bed there God you help me right now you foul spirit from hell that's not your property he belongs to the Lord and we give you honor and glory for your divine intervention in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.